you very much, everybody. Please. So welcome to our cabinet meeting. And every member of my cabinet is working tirelessly to defeat the invisible enemy that should have never happened to our country, should have never happened to the world. It's a disgrace. Could have been stopped at the source, but they decided not to do that. But we're going to safely reopen our country and our economy, and it's happening very rapidly. And it's happening, interestingly, when numbers are actually going down. You look at Florida, the state of Florida, did a great job. You look at Georgia, you look at others, they're open. And some are doing extremely well, far beyond what people thought. And the numbers are going down. The numbers that we have been talking about for the last two months, they're actually going down. So it's really terrific. In our drive to crush the virus, the U.S. has completed nearly 12 million tests. And that test, that number today is almost 14 million. Nobody's close. Germany would be second with approximately 10 million less than us. And we also have the best tests. South Korea is doing very well, but we're at 14 million, and they're at numbers that are very small by comparison. What has been done with testing, what's been done with ventilators, what's been done with the distribution of product has been incredible. We've made a lot of governors look very good. We've actually made all of the governors look very good. Some have done a good job, but we've made them all look very good. We got them equipment, and they got them their gowns, and their ventilators, and their tests like nobody would have thought possible. Vaccines are moving quickly into phase one and phase two trials, and trials of dozens of therapies and cures are underway. And we're making tremendous strides with therapies, cures, and vaccines. I think we're way ahead of schedule. And you probably heard logistically, we have our military engaged. And as soon as we have whatever it is that we're going to have, whether it's therapeutic or vaccine, uh, it will be distributed very rapidly. Our military is ready to go. They can deploy hundreds of thousands of men and women a day. And now what they're going to be doing is they're going to be doing the vaccine, which we are geared up for even before we have it but the chances of us having it are extraordinary. Secretary Azar will update us on all that we're doing to safeguard Americans. will be talking in a second. To protect our people and defeat the virus, we must also defend the health of our nation's economy. Secretary Mnuchin will report on the economic recovery efforts and the good numbers that are being produced ahead of schedule. Secretary Carson will update us on the White House Opportunity and Revitalization Council. And Ben, you've done a fantastic job. We appreciate it. He's looked at uh, HUD much differently than people that would have been in the pure real estate business. And he has a, a way of seeing things that's different and really good for our country. And Ben's working on uh, very hard different plans to restore health and prosperity to disadvantaged and minority communities, and that's really working out well. One of the things we're very proud of is Opportunity Zones. Tim Scott of South Carolina came to me with a proposal, and few people understand how successful the Opportunity Zones have been. It's a great tribute to Tim and to others in the Senate that helped us with that. The pandemic has shown once again the vital importance of economic independence and bringing supply chains back from China and other countries. I probably got elected. One of the primary reasons was that. Make America great again. America first. Call it whatever you want. But we went way out of bounds. We build a car, and we go to 12 countries to build a car. I want to build a car from one country. We make the parts. To achieve this goal, we've slashed red tape and bureaucracy and unleashed the largest industrial mobilization since World War II especially when it comes to big things like a ventilator. It's a very big, clumsy, highly sophisticated product. And we have now assembly lines. We're the talk of the world. We're supplying them to other countries. We're helping other countries that are going through this plague. And they're never going to be able to do ventilators. So we are — it's really been an incredible thing what's happened. It's the biggest mobilization since World War II. And we're fighting for the livelihoods of American workers, and we must continue to cut through every 
piece of red tape that stands in our way. And that's why this is such an exciting meeting, beyond being a cabinet meeting, which is always good. Because with millions of Americans forced out of work by the virus, it's more important than ever to remove burdens that destroy American jobs. In a few minutes, I will sign an executive order instructing federal agencies to use any and all authority to waive, suspend, and eliminate unnecessary regulations that impede economic recovery. And we want to leave it that way. We want to leave it that way. In some cases, we won't be able to, but in other cases, we will. And you've heard me say many times, I've said, and I've said it very strongly, that regulations, we've done more regulation cutting than any president in history, whether they're there for four years, eight years, or in one case more. We've done more regulation cutting. I don't mean just in a year or two years. I mean, in the three and a half years that we've been here, we've cut far more regulations by a factor of a lot than any other administration, any other presidency. So that's really something. I'm directing agencies to review the hundreds of regulations we've already suspended in response to the virus and make these suspensions permanent where possible. I'm also instructing agencies to use the emergency authorities to speed up regulation cuts or new rules that will create jobs and prosperity and get rid of unnecessary rules and regulations. We had cases where it would take 20 years to build a highway. You'd have to go through various agencies to get the same permit. I lived with it in the private sector, so I know it better than anybody. Where you go years and years and years to build a simple roadway or a simple building, and it would end up costing an absolute fortune, many, many times what it should cost. And it would take years before you could even seek final approval, five years, seven years, 20 years, 21 years, a certain highway built recently, a small highway. I would call it a road, 21 years to get it approved. And then by the time they get it approved, it costs a hundred times more in some numbers that you wouldn't even believe. We're getting rid of all of that. We're down now on roads, working with Elaine and Department of Transportation. We're down to a two-year period. We want to see if we can do better. We have roads in there for 18, 17, 20, 21 years, over the years. I'm not blaming Elaine for that. I'm just saying over the years, there have been roads that have gone through a process for many years, roads and highways. So we're going to be getting it down to a year. And maybe it's not going to get passed for environmental reasons or safety reasons, but we're going to know quickly. But if it does pass, it's going to happen fast. Acting OMB director, soon to be permanent director. Where is Russ? Did you hear what I said? Soon to be permanent director. Okay, that's a big statement. Some people would say that's big news. He's done a fantastic job, so congratulations. Well, we have to get him to approve, but okay. we'll give you a congratulations just prior to approval, right? So you're doing great. Thank you very much. So acting OMB Director Russ Vaught will present details on this effort, and uh, we'll go into that. So Russ is uh, done a great job on exactly what we're he used to come into my office and he'd say uh i think we can cut a lot of different things in terms of regulation and russ i think also very importantly uh, we'll have a better product it's actually going to give us a better result and we're adhering to environmental the environmental impact studies and all of the other things we have to do to get these permits but so russ vote thank you very much I want to once again thank every member of the Cabinet for your commitment to helping our nation reopen, to recover and rebuild. I'd like to now ask a man who's done a fantastic job as the head of the task force. He's worked uh, literally, I mean, I think literally 24 hours a day sometimes to make sure everything's gone well. Today we had a uh, really great article by Rich Lowry who uh, talked about the tremendous job that we've done in terms of the task force, in terms of the coronavirus and getting things going and getting people what they need, whether it's ventilators, testing, or many other things. And I appreciated that article very much because uh, there's been a very false narrative. Uh, people have no idea what an incredible job the people in federal government have done. And that includes generals and admirals and lots of others. So. I want to thank uh, Mike Pence for the great job you've done, Mike, and please say a few words. 
Mr. President, and um, I think everyone around this cabinet knows that uh, from the first day of this administration, you've made it clear that you have no higher priority than the safety and security of the American people. Um, in January, when you took the unprecedented action of suspending all travel from China, before there was a single case of community transmission in the United States, uh, it is inarguable, Mr. President, that your decision bought us a critical amount of time to stand up a national response uh, all across this country. At the same time, in January, you stood up the White House Coronavirus a task force, uh, and over the course of uh, February, you began to suspend more travel, establish screening uh, at more than 11 airports around the United States, again with the priority uh, of, uh, of, of protecting the health and safety uh, of the American people. And from the first day, Mr. President, that you asked me to lead the White House Coronavirus Task Force, we have, we have focused on the health of the American people. It would be on uh, March 15th at your direction uh, that we released uh, the, uh, uh, the White House uh, coronavirus guidelines for America. We asked a lot of the American people, and the American people responded. Uh, 15 days would become 45 days, and in that time, it was our objective, Mr. President, as you made clear, uh, to save lives, uh, to slow the spread, to flatten the curve. And because of what the American people did, because of the direction that you gave, and all of the dedicated members at HHS and FEMA and all of those around this table who served on the task force, because of the partnership that you forged with uh, every governor of both political parties across the country, uh, we've made great progress. That being said, Mr. President, I know that um, you believe, as we all do, that one life lost is too many. And, uh, and we grieve today for the loss of more than 90,000 Americans to the coronavirus. But at a time like this, the first cabinet we meeting that we have had uh, since the advent of this epidemic, um, it's important to remember that when we ask the American people to make all of those sacrifices, the estimates before you were that if we did nothing, uh, we could lose between one million and 2.2 million American lives. And in fact, even by taking the steps that we took, the estimates were still clear that even if we flattened the curve, that we could still lose 100,000 to 240,000 Americans. And so while we grieve the loss of those more than 90,000 Americans and their families are on our hearts today, we recognize, we recognize the progress that we have made uh, among the progress that we made, Mr. President, in, in flattening the curve and slowing the spread was preserving, as you directed, the capacity of our health care system. One of the great concerns that we had early on was that our health care system, our hospitals, would be overwhelmed by the coronavirus. That did not occur, Mr. President. The truth is, as you've reflected many times, uh, because of uh, the ingenuity of the American people, because of our partnership with states, because of a great logistics team, uh, that worked with the task force. No American who has needed a ventilator was ever denied a ventilator in the United States. It is an extraordinary accomplishment. And the report that I received today is that the national stockpile now has more than 15,000 ventilators. And because of the public-private partnerships that you forged, we'll actually see American companies uh, manufacture more than 110,000 ventilators in 100 days. Over 13 billion supplies and critical PPE were also delivered uh, to doctors and nurses and first responders and to Americans on the front lines of this uh, pandemic. And on the subject of testing, Mr. President, um, when you tapped me to lead this task force, uh, we had fully done, under the old system of public labs, um, we had fully done only 8,400 coronavirus tests at the end of February. But as you just reflected, um, because of the public-private partnership that you formed with commercial labs across the country, we've now performed nearly 12 million coronavirus tests and more than 400,000 in a single day this past weekend. And Mr. President, as I'll share with the team, as we're increasing testing, the good news to Americans is nevertheless cases are going down 
You reflected on that uh, in your visit to the Capitol today and in your opening remarks. And in that, I hope despite the heartbreak and the hardship that we have all endured, I hope the American people can sense that they've made progress, uh, that uh, as we continue to scale testing all across the country, our, our team with Admiral Girard at the helm and FEMA at the helm estimates that we'll be able to conduct maybe 40 to 50 million tests a month by this September. And even as testing is expanding across the country, we're seeing cases coming down, and that's a tribute to the American people. But it's not just been the health of the American people that's been challenged, Mr. President. As you rightly observed, businesses large and small um, who have uh, had to shutter their operations. We heard from restaurant owners earlier this week. And, and with the great work of our Secretary of the Treasury and your leadership, Mr. President, um, $188 billion in loans have been approved to small businesses. Nearly $583 million have been awarded through community health centers, uh, all 50 states. We have been there at the point of the need for businesses large and small. We have been there for vulnerable populations. And at your direction, Mr. President, we'll continue to lean forward in that fight. The action that you're taking today with signing the executive order is going to make it even more possible for us to to build this economy back again for the American people. And it was in that spirit that one month ago, Mr. President, as I close, uh, you directed the White House Coronavirus Task Force to release uh, guidelines to open up America again. And I'm, uh, I'm proud to report to the cabinet today that um, uh, our best information is that all 50 states, as of today, are partially reopening their economies. And the American people are responding and breathing that uh, free air again. They're doing it responsibly. Uh, they're, they're enjoying uh, the opportunity to be out in many states to enjoy restaurants, businesses opening back up. The big three automakers went back to work this last Monday in Ben Carson's hometown of Detroit. And America is on its way back through a great, great season of hardship. Uh, it's a testament to the resilience uh, of the American people. So, Mr. President, you charged the White House Coronavirus uh, Task Force to have one mission, and that was save lives, to have one team, and that was to forge relationships all across the country. And because of uh, your leadership, because of the great work of this cabinet, because of governors around the country, but mostly because of our incredible health care workers and the cooperation of the American people, we've slowed the spread, we flattened the curve, and we are reopening America. And Mr. President, I'm proud to report to you that we're on our way. And I promise you this entire team is going to continue to work with governors around the country at your direction until we bring the American economy all the way back, as you often say, bigger and better than ever before. So thank you, Mr. President. Thank you very much, Mike. And again, thank you very much for doing a great job. So I'm going to sign this now, and then Ben and Steve will speak, and then we'll go around the room a little bit and uh, – We'll say what uh, we want. I'd like to congratulate Rick Grinnell for doing such a fantastic job as acting. I don't think you want to be permanent, so I think you're very happy to be acting. But what a job. I think you'll go down as the all-time great acting ever at any position. So thank you very much, Rick. Thank you very much. Would you like to say something? Go ahead, please. Uh, sure. Uh I would just say greetings from an Intel community that is very interested in providing policymakers, everybody around this table, with raw intelligence that is not politicized in any possible way. And I have to tell you, Mr. President, that I have heard from hundreds of members of the current Intel community who are extremely pleased with transparency of their work. And that's what they're shooting for. That's what they want to provide to policymakers is uh, information that is not politicized by uh, politicians in any way on any side of the aisle, but to be able to protect their intelligence estimates. We all know that they're estimates, and they are proud to give them when not manipulated by others. Well, we appreciate your great work. Thank you, Rick, very much. Thank you, sir. Uh, I'm going to sign this now. and. Uh... So this is regulations are going to be cut, and the potential is that you're going to find regulations that nobody has ever thought of before, because you're going to be doing it yourselves, and this gives you great authority to cut regulations. So we've already had the record by a lot. It's not even close, but 
uh, you'll have a chance to cut regulations. When I look at EPA sitting here, and I look at the veterans sitting here, and I look at all of the different people, Homeland Security, Chad, uh, I look at all of the uh, great talent around this table. You'll have a right to do something that nobody would ever have thought you would have the right to do that. And uh, so I just want you to go to town and do it right, do it proper, make sure everything is safe, and make sure it's environmentally good for those of you that are in that category. But uh, it's very, uh, very important. Elaine, you can do things that nobody would believe in your department, Department of Transportation. So uh, good luck. And I'm signing this. It gives you tremendous power to cut regulation. Here you go, Ben. Here, take that. Okay, uh, Ben, would you like to say something, please? Uh, yes, sir. Thank you, Mr. You President. And um, a, a big thank you to all the Cabinet members. Almost everybody has been deeply involved in the refocusing of the uh, Opportunity and Revitalization Council. And uh, uh, Jared and Christian and Brooke, also big, big help. Uh, just as was done during the greatest generation, many sectors of our society are being reconfigured to meet the singular goal of winning our war against this invisible enemy. Companies that made bedding linen are now making masks, and uh, plants that produce vehicles are now producing ventilators. I worked at some of those plants growing up in Detroit. And now the White House Opportunity and Revitalization Council, which was formed by you to help long forgotten communities achieve economic opportunity will refocus and expand to help America's hardest hit communities and achieve economic recovery, overcome health disparities, and thrive through educational advancement. Education being the ticket. It doesn't matter where you came from, you get a good education, you can write your own ticket. Since your historic Tax Cuts and Job Act, billions of dollars from the private sector have been invested in these designated opportunity zones, which are home to nearly 35 million people. Through this initiative, we've fostered partnerships between people who seldom sit down together. We're talking about uh, business leaders, community leaders, faith-based leaders, housing advocates, investors, builders, state and local and federal officials. The Revitalization Council, which I have the privilege to chair, alongside our executive director, Scott Turner, who's in, here in this room somewhere, um, Oh, there he is over there. Okay. Has played a, a, a big role in the success, identifying more than 270 different federal actions to support and increase investment in opportunity zones through things like grant preference points, loan qualifications, reduced fees, eligibility criteria modifications, and a number of other incentives. And at your direction, we're now taking our considerable capacity to discover opportunity and drive recovery in disadvantaged and minority communities that are disproportionately affected by COVID-19. Based on our work and analysis, the Revitalization Council is identifying diverse policy approaches in areas including housing, education, technology, broadband, workforce, entrepreneurship, health, and long-term community development. And under your leadership, this administration has shined a light on the forgotten men and women whose job prospect, prospects and health disparities are often hidden in the shadows. Mr. President, you've been a champion for all Americans, especially our low income and minority communities. And uh, we're committed to continuing, continuing your work, not only to restore, but to advance the historic gains in prosperity many enjoyed before this global epidemic. Uh, your council will not only continue its focus to bring more jobs and better jobs, but it will also expand to better fortify public health services that will improve medical and social health outcomes and uplift our most distressed communities. The American people will come out the other side of this crisis stronger and more determined than ever 
Thanks to the authority you have vested in, in the Revitalization Council, we will leverage these powers to heal America's hardest hit communities and return to prosperity as safely and swiftly as possible. And thank you for not giving in to the naysayers and to the people who use fear to control people. And instead, giving people hope, not with just your words, but with your actions. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, Ben. You know, I had a run against him, and he was very tough. <laughs> and uh, he was even tougher when he'd run onto a stage holding a Bible up in the air. That was tough. I said, that's tough to beat. But I said, if I'm ever so lucky, I have to get him in the administration. So that's what happened, and you've done a great job. Thank you very much. Steve, where are we and what are we doing? Thank you, Mr. President. So I'm pleased to report uh, your administration has been hard at work implementing the CARES Act. We've really made incredible progress over the last month working on putting over $3 trillion into the economy. Unprecedented amount of support for American business and American workers. And I just want to highlight a few of the things. Uh, working with SBA, we were able to develop the Paycheck Protection Program from scratch. That's now impacted over 4.3 million companies, impacting over 50 million workers, $513 billion, having 5,500 lenders working. And we are extremely pleased that we have increased the number of CDFIs and minority lenders and fintech lenders, now making sure we get this uh, across the country with an average loan size of 118,000. So, this program is really impacting American workers. Um, working with the Federal Reserve, I have approved nine special facilities, totaling about $2.5 trillion. That's about half of our capacity. And in particular, I'd just like to highlight the Main Street Lending Program, which is for small and mid-market companies, will be up and running by the end of this month. And then I would just comment on uh, the economic impact payments, Mr. President, have really had a big impact. We've delivered over $239 billion to 141 million Americans. And I want to highlight, we couldn't be more pleased, 114 million of those, we did direct deposit into people's accounts. We did 27 million checks. And, Mr. President, we now have developed debit cards. So. Uh, in an effort to expedite money to people even quicker in a very safe way. Uh, I'm pleased to show you what a debit card looks like with your name on it, Mr. President. Now, there's no money for you on it. This is a blank debit card, but I want you to see what many Americans will now get uh, so that we could get their money to them even quicker. And going forward, we think debit cards are a safe and secure way of de delivering refunds. So, Do I sign the letter again or not? For the next time we send money, you'll get to send another letter. <laughs> All right. Thank you, Steve. Steve has had a great career. He had a great educational career, a tremendous student, and uh, went on to very, very tremendous business success. And uh, all of that experience was necessary for what you're doing, right? But uh, there's nobody better with money and controlling money and handling money. So I want to thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Alex, please say a few words. Well, thank you, Mr. President. Uh, you know, your top priority has always been the health, safety, and well-being of the American people as we've been going through this pandemic. And that's been our priority throughout this crisis. We've got to get life back to normal, and we've got to restart the roaring Trump economy, and we have the tools to do that. The right mindset for reopening is not about balancing health versus the economy. It's actually about balancing health versus health. Um, by one estimate, the virus-induced recession will see an extra 65,000 deaths from suicide, drug overdose, alcohol abuse in the coming years, possibly even more. States are seeing a decline in the reporting of child maltreatment uh, because kids aren't at school. They're not seeing doctors and teachers who would otherwise report maltreatment in the home environment, and so it goes unaddressed. Mammograms are down 87%. Colonoscopies are down 90%. Approximately 1.7 million new cancer cases are diagnosed per year in our country. And if we're seeing an 80% drop in cancer cases identified, we could already have 300,000 or more undiagnosed cancer cases as a result of this crisis. A CDC report found 
a 60% reduction in vaccine administrations, including for our kids, pediatric vaccinations, millions of kids not getting vaccinated. The good news is that under your leadership, we built a path forward so that we can have safe reopening. We have the surveillance tools. We have the testing tools. We have the containment methodologies and resources. We are developing therapeutics and we're developing vaccines. So we have the strategy and the recipe to support the safe reopening of our economy. And for the sake of Americans' health and well-being, we've got to support this and move ahead with safe reopening. You know, I, I mentioned some of the physical health risks of, the, of keeping our country closed down. But we have here today with us our Assistant Secretary for Substance Abuse, for, for, for Mental Health and Substance Abuse, Dr. Ellie McCants Katz, who's a psychiatrist and is the first ever psychiatrist to lead SAMHSA. And she, if you don't mind, was going to say a couple words really about how extended stay at home orders can impose really lasting mental health challenges for us. If that's okay, Mr. President. We'd love that. Please, Doctor. Mr. President, Vice President Pence, members of the cabinet and colleagues. As I've listened to states and communities struggle with mental, mental illness issues that have arisen as a result of the virus, I wanted to ensure that governors yesterday heard these concerns from a medical perspective. As my physician colleagues on the task force have been careful to rightly note, their perspective and advice centers on one aspect of the pandemic, virus containment. However, even medically, it is not the sole perspective. I felt that it was important to offer the governors a different, albeit equally important, medical perspective. As such, I made the following remarks. It is my privilege to serve as the Assistant Secretary for Mental Health and Substance Use, but today I really speak to you more as a psychiatrist who also happens to hold a PhD in infectious disease epidemiology. Never did I imagine the nation would be experiencing the coinciding of mental health issues and infectious disease that my training addressed. The research literature is clear on the effects of quarantine and stay-at-home practices on mental health. We know that the longer the duration of these orders, the greater the intensity of the mental health problems experienced. We also know that these symptoms persist for years to come, even once quarantine is lifted. The data tell us that when the lives of adults, children, and families are drastically changed for extended lengths of time, for many, anxiety, depression, and stress disorders will become manifest and will persist. These are real health conditions with potentially long-lasting consequences that must be taken seriously. To put all of this in perspective, I believe it is important to point out that Pre-pandemic, we lose 120,000 lives a year to drug overdose and suicide. How many more lives are we willing to sacrifice in the name of containing the virus? When we look at strategies to reopen as a medical doctor, I ask that you take into account whole health, not just one narrow aspect of physical health. We continually ask ourselves what the health costs and risks may be of reopening, but I ask what might they be of not reopening or reopening in such a restrictive way that American lives are not restored. Of course, containing the effects of coronavirus are critically important, but so too is preventing suicide. So too is keeping a person from being terrified to ever leave their home. So too is protecting the mental health of our nation's young people. I ask you to remember that not every home is a safe home. Not every individual can withstand the trauma of not seeing or interacting physically with loved ones. Not every parent can survive the mental anguish of not being able to feed their children because of lost employment. Not every child can exist in a healthy way without the structure and support of school. We have to take a step back and recognize the other effects of our policies. While we contain the virus, are we increasing the risk for suicide and drug overdose? Are we creating a future of substance use and addiction for millions of additional Americans? And if we are doing those things, why have we decided collectively that this is okay? We've worked so hard in states and communities across this country to combat epidemics like the opioids crisis. Why are we willing to forget those efforts now or deem them less important? As a psychiatrist, I would argue that a life lost to suicide is just as important 
as a life lost to coronavirus. A family who loses someone to drug overdose experiences the same grief as a family who loses a loved one to coronavirus. Let us not forget that all American lives are precious. Our citizens count on us to remember their health and safety in all aspects of life. The preservation of America's health and the health of our citizens cannot be measured by only one metric. Virus containment cannot be our only goal, no matter the cost to Americans. If we ignore the reality of the enormous mental health strain we put on our citizens on the backdrop of an already overburdened mental health care system, I'm saddened but certain that the next major public health crisis of our time will be that of mental and substance use disorders, and it is not far behind. I urge you to factor this reality into your planning, and I thank you for the work you've done thus far on behalf of the millions of Americans with mental and substance use disorders. Thank you very much, Doctor. Appreciate it. Very sobering. That's tough. That's very tough. Uh, but we're getting there. We're getting back, and that's very important. Thank you. Great job. Uh, I'd like to ask Chad Wolf from Homeland Security just to say, uh, maybe discuss the record low numbers we have of people crossing the border, our southern border in particular. Absolutely, Mr. President. I think we are taking, uh, at your direction, the Vice President's direction, the task force, we've taken a number of measures that protecting public health, uh, proactive and, and prudent measures at the border. Uh, those include non-essential travel restrictions that we have with both Canada and Mexico. Those also include continued construction of the border wall system, but perhaps most importantly, new measures that we've instituted along that southwest border regarding illegal border entries. And those are the numbers that you're referring to. Last month in April, we had a little under 17,000 uh, folks that crossed the border illegally. Compare that to a year ago, April of 19 was over 120,000 individuals. So and they were all brought out, right? That's right. And so 80% of those 17,000 crossed, but 17,000 were brought out. 80 sent back. 80% of uh, those 17,000 were removed within 120 minutes, two hours. Uh, the rest uh, took just a little bit longer, but are continuing to be removed as well. So, And that's a first. That's a first in the last 40 years. That's absolutely right. Again, at, the, at your leadership, the task force leadership, we continue to make progress on that border. Good. Thank, Thank you. you very much, Chad. Thank you. Also, Mark Meadows, who's our chief of staff, he's uh, been around Washington for a while. He's very popular in North Carolina. He had a seat that was very easy for him to keep, and I talked to him long and hard for a while, for, for a long while. But he's a friend of mine, but he's, uh, he's going to go down as the ultimate, hopefully, chief of staff. So, Mark, it's really nice to have you. Would you like to say a few words? Uh, thank you, Mr. President. Obviously, your work and the work of this cabinet on behalf of the American people is, is very evident. It's uh, critical that we make sure that Americans are healthy, safe, secure, and prosperous. And because of the work of everyone around this table, and more importantly, your leadership, uh, we're setting the example of how not only to uh, tackle one of the most difficult silent killers that we've ever faced in our history, but also how to come out of that more united. And because of your executive order today, uh, we are not only ready to reopen our uh, country, but we're open for business once again. So I thank you for your leadership, and it's an honor to serve you and the people of this great country. Thank you very much, Mark. You're doing really, really well. Appreciate it. And Bob Lighthizer is working on the uh, trade deal with UK, United Kingdom, and uh, I hear they want to very much do it, and we'd like to do it. Uh, how are you doing? Well, thank you, Mr. President. We're doing well. I'm never in a hurry to do a deal, as you know. So, yeah, yeah, we'll see how that works out. I would like to report, though, that on July 1st, we'll have USMCA fully in effect. Uh, which is just in time for the reopening. We'll have the new rules that will help American workers, farmers, ranchers. And we're, we're now beginning to see some substantial uh, new sales. I'll defer to Sonny, of course, on agriculture, but in the agriculture area and a variety of others because of this and the other deals that you've done. Uh, but uh, in terms of the UK deal, we're, we're just beginning that, and we'll see how that turns As you said to me a thousand times, we'll see how that turns out. So, how can I tell him? We'll see how that turns out. That's through experience. You never know. You never know, do you? Well, we usually do. And actually, we've signed a great deal with Japan, $40 billion. Uh, we've uh, 
created a new deal with South Korea, which was many, many billions of dollars. It was a defective deal. Now it's a very good deal. But USMTA is actually the largest trade deal ever made anywhere in the world. People don't realize the amount of, of business that we do with Canada and with Mexico is monumental. It's the biggest trade deal in the world, uh, bigger than the deal we made with China. Most people don't know that. And uh, the China deal is kicking in. They're buying a lot. But uh, I feel differently now about that deal than I did three months ago. And uh, we'll see what all happens. But uh, it's been a very disappointing situation. Very disappointing thing happened with China because the plague flowed in. Now, that wasn't supposed to happen, and it could have been stopped. So I want to thank you very much, Bob. You're doing really a fantastic deal. You have a lot of records, and uh, one of the people I wanted to get when I was elected was Bob Lighthizer, because he had the record and really had the reputation as being the best trade negotiator anywhere in the world that everybody respected. He was the authority. So I got him, and uh, you've lived up to your reputation. Now let's see if you can exceed it. So you have plenty of work to do. It's How is it going it's with the UK? Take four what do you years, think? four more years to do it. I know. Uh, that's all. Well, the that's Boris, all I ask. the first thing Boris did when he got, when fortunately he was better because he's a great guy. Boris Johnson, Prime Minister, he called me and he wanted to talk about the trade deal. How's it going? That was his first words to me. How's the trade deal going? I said, How are you feeling? So it was really something. But great job. And Mike Pompeo has done a fantastic job at State, and. Uh, He's been doing a lot of traveling, working hard. Uh, anything to say, Mike? Uh, sir, I'll just add that uh, in the course of this, we've brought 93,000 Americans back home who were stuck because travel had ceased. Uh, State Department's done fantastic work getting these Americans back to their families. There's still a few more out there. We've still got a little more work to do. And we're working to make sure that the global economy gets back on its feet, too. So along with Department of Homeland Security, Department of Transportation, trying to make sure that we've got all the processes in place so people can travel again in the way that they did before this virus hit this entire world. Good, Mike. Thanks. Great job. I'd like to maybe ask Scott Turner to finish. He's uh, somebody who's young and strong and powerful, and he's done an incredible job with Opportunity Zones and other things. And maybe you could finish it off, and we could take a couple of questions from the media if you'd like. But, uh, Scott, make the media so crazed <laughs> that they say, boy, are they doing a great job. Thank you, Mr. President, for the opportunity to give up. Thank you, Mr. President, uh, for your leadership and uh, Secretary Carson. And Thank you all. And, you know, I was sitting here listening um, um, to all the remarks um, and what's going on, and I'm very encouraged. And I was reminded of my time from playing Pee Wee football all the way to the NFL. And one of the greatest times that we had was the huddle. The last time I was with you all was last summer. We had traveled to 21 cities in 12 weeks, and y'all encouraged me greatly. And so we finished by traveling to over 60 cities with the Opportunity Zone and the Council. And much fruit came about in America because of the White House Opportunity and Revitalization Council. And many of you, your staff members and your teams from your agencies have been tremendous. And it has been a great team effort. Not one man, not one person. It's been a great team that's brought much fruit because of Opportunity Zones in America to the, to the people inside of distressed communities. And I'm so humbled by that. But we have a lot of work to do. Our resolve is still the same. Our spirit is the same. Our fortitude is even stronger. The president has refocused the council, so our vision is broader. And because of that, we will not quit. And I want to thank all of you for your leadership. Thank you for your vision. Thank you for your encouragement. But back to the huddle. In the huddle, it was a time to refocus. It was a time to reset and to encourage one another. I know you got beat on that play, but you won't get beat on the next one. And we have you, we have your back. We were a team. The enemy was on the other side of the ball. In America, we are a team. The enemy is COVID. And I want to remind everybody in the room and everybody listening in America, we're all one team. This is the huddle today. We're encouraging each other. 
We have each other's back. We know to anticipate what's happening on the next play. We have a great game plan. We got great leadership all around the room. It's a tremendous team. And it's called the United States of America. COVID will get whooped. <laughs> it will. But it's going to take all of us. And I say that, Mr. President, because this is a blessing to me to be in this home. But when we say ready, break, the enemy better look out. Because we're going to be victorious against the enemy and have long-term sustainability and a generational vision for America. So long after we're gone, the people that come behind us will be blessed. So I want y'all to be encouraged and thank you, Mr. President, thank you, Dr. Carson, and Mr. Vice President, all of you for your leadership. And I'm encouraged to be here, so thank you. So, you know, we have a couple of seats available, congressional seats, where I'm not overly impressed with the candidate. And I think, would you like to move to a little different section of the United States? Because I could guarantee this guy would be in Congress in about two minutes. And, you know, I know somebody that knew Scott from the NFL. I said, what kind of a player was he? He said he was fast, but more than anything else, he was tough. He was just mean and tough. And that's what we want. He's tough, but he's got a great heart. He's got a great heart. And I've known him now a long time, Scott. And we're lucky to have you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Fantastic. True. We're tough. Okay. Any questions, please? Yes. Steve, go ahead. No, it just seems to mean less to me because, you know, we did this great deal with China. They have to buy billions and billions of dollars of product, farm product and other product. And it was very exciting, one of the biggest deals ever made. Actually, not as big as the USMCA, which surprises people, but it could have been bigger over a period of time because uh, the potential there is just beginning, in a sense. And uh, it was very exciting. But once the virus came in, once the plague, as I call it, came in, uh, I said, how did they let that happen? How did they let that happen? And how come it didn't go into other sections of China? Why did they block it from leaving Wuhan, but they didn't block it from going to the rest of the world, including the United States? Why is that? Beijing doesn't have it. Other places don't have it. So why is it that it was blocked very effectively from leaving that area and going into China, but it went out to the rest of the world, including the United States. And why didn't they let us go in and help them fix it? So I'm very disappointed in China. Yeah. Mr. President, why has — Just to follow up, you've been talking about possible retaliation for that. Are you any closer to a decision on that, sir? I don't talk about retaliation. Go ahead. Mr. President, why haven't you announced a plan to get 36 million unemployed Americans back to work? You're overseeing historic economic despair. Oh, I think, I think we've announced a plan. We're opening up our country. Just a rude person you are. We're opening up our country. Uh, we're opening it up very fast. Uh, the plan is that each state is opening, and it's opening up uh, very effectively. And uh, you, when you see the numbers, I think uh, even you will be impressed, which is pretty hard to impress you. Yeah, go ahead, please. Go ahead. It's enough for you. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, Canada has confirmed that the border is going to remain closed until June 21st, 10 days before right. the UNS USMC. Aren't you worried for the economy of the border states? Yeah, we do. And we speak to Canada all the time. Obviously, the relationship is very good with the Prime Minister and myself and with the two countries. You know, Canada is uh, our neighbor. We have a great relationship. We love Canada. Uh, so we're going to be talking, and at the right time, we'll open that up very quickly. That'll go very easily. Yeah, please. Happen. It could happen before June 21st? Uh, yeah, it could. Sure, it could. Uh, They're doing well. We're doing well. We're both doing well. Thank you. Uh, Mr. President, you've said repeatedly that the United States is now the king of ventilators and that we have so many that we're sending them uh, overseas, selling them, and then in some cases actually gifting them to other countries. Um, my question is, are you looking to use these diplomatically to strengthen ties with other nations and counter Chinese influence in some parts no. of the world? No, I'm not looking to do diplomatically. I'm looking to save lives. If we can save lives of another country, that's a great thing. 
So I'm only looking to save lives. Probably that's good diplomatically, but I'm not looking at that. You have countries that have no chance. They have no ventilators. They, would, they don't have a capacity to build them. And we're sending hundreds and even thousands, and we have thousands now, and they're being produced at a very rapid pace. Jared and his whole team of geniuses from Silicon Valley and other places came in, and they've done an incredible job. So we have them by the thousands. We had none, essentially. We had very few, and they were obsolete. They were broken. Uh, we're building not only a, a lot of them, but we have a very high-quality ventilator, one of the highest. So countries know that, and they're calling us, and they're asking for help. They need help. So I, I, I only think in terms of saving lives, uh, the country, uh, we've gotten some very unusual calls from people that normally wouldn't be calling us too easily, calling, asking for help. You know, you can get swabs, and you can get gowns, and you can get a lot of things, but getting ventilators is very tough, very, very tough, because uh, it's a very complex machine, very expensive machine. So we've done a, a very good job, and probably it does help diplomatically, but we do it for helping people's lives, save lives. Yes, please, please. Mr. President, <laughs> yeah. uh, do you — so Ford Motor Company has previously required visitors to wear masks when they visit their facilities. Do you plan to wear one when you go there on Thursday? I don't know. It's, I haven't even thought of it. It depends. I mean, you know, in certain areas I would, in certain areas I don't. But uh, I will certainly look at it. It depends on what situation. Am I standing right next to everybody or am I spread out? And also, you look, you know, uh, is something a hospital? Is it a ward? Is it what is it exactly? I, I'm going to a plant. So we'll see. Where it's appropriate, I would do it, certainly. Yeah. Mr. President, you continue to talk about uh, helping minority communities. What specifically are you looking at to help those communities? What actions? So one of the things I was most proud of was the minority community and all of the work we've done for the minority communities. Black unemployment, Hispanic unemployment, Asian unemployment was the best ever in the history of our country. We've never had anything like it. We've never had so many uh, African-American jobs ever ever in the history of our country by far. And we are bringing our country back, and a big focus is exactly that, with the uh, minorities. Uh, specifically, uh, if you look at uh, the Asians, they've done incredibly well. Hispanics, incredibly well. African Americans, uh, record-setting every month. You know that. Every month, it was a record-setting jobs number. And that's what we want to do. We want to get it back to that level. We had to artificially close our country. One day, we had it. We did the right thing. We would have lost millions of lives if we didn't. Think of it. If we lost 100,000 lives, the minimum we would have lost is a million two, million three, million five, maybe. But take it to a million. So that would mean 10 times more that we lost already. Now, I've seen hospitals like Elmhurst, Queens, where I grew up near that. I know that hospital where they had one day 11 body bags in a hallway, and they had some outside, and that they had refrigerated trucks coming to take bodies away. Now, multiply that times 10. It would have been unacceptable. And that's the lowest number possible. It probably would have been times 20 or maybe 25. So we did the right thing, but now we have to get back to work. And we want to open up, and the people want to open up. But we've learned a lot about the disease. We've learned about distancing. Nobody ever heard of social distancing before. We've learned about the washing of hands. I used to wash my hands a lot, but I tell you right now, I wash them more. We learned a lot. And we also learned how to put out the embers or the fires, whatever may come. We learned without having to close down the whole country. And we have big sections of our country that don't have much of a problem. We have some sections that don't have any problem at all. So we're opening up our country. We're doing really well. And most excitingly, we're working on vaccines, therapeutics, and cures that are really moving along at a level that nobody would have thought possible. And the military, I could say Mark Esper. Okay, you know Mark Esper. He's become a very important person in the world of medicine because his military is going to be distributing, whether it's uh, therapeutically or whether it's uh, cures or whether it's a vaccine. Uh, and, and by the way, I have to say, all three are doing unbelievably well. But Mark 
and the military are going to be getting him out. So he has hundreds of thousands of people that he is immediately that work for us right now. They're fully ready to deploy. They're ready to get the job done. They'll be doing it in a record business. And everything we've done with the military has been terrific. Uh, we've had admirals. We've had generals. I remember when Cry and Chuck Schumer said, we should get the military involved. I said, they are. He said, we should use one of our generals. I said, we do. Our generals have done a great job, Jared, right? And our admirals have done a great We had everybody involved. And they are tremendously talented people. And this isn't what they do. They fight. They're great fighters. And they fight. But, uh, yeah, the minority communities are really going to be well served. I think we are going to get that right back. And this includes everybody. This includes our whole country. But right back to where it was, which was record-setting numbers. Right now, that you are considering for those communities. Uh, right now, we're opening up areas, and a lot of people are getting jobs. I heard some numbers yesterday that were really incredible. The amount, percentage-wise, of the country that opened up so quickly over the last few days. I think you're going to see some very big numbers, and I think next year is going to be an incredible year economically. You can never make up for all of the loss of life. You can never do that. From an economic standpoint, however, next year is going to be — I think it's going to be potentially a great year for us. Yeah. Please. The FDA has said hydroxychloroquine should not be used outside of a hospital setting or — No, that's not what I was told. No. So there was a false study done where they gave it to very sick people, extremely sick people, people that were ready to die. It was given by, obviously, not friends of the administration. And the study came out. The people were ready to die. Uh, everybody was old, had bad problems with hearts, diabetes, and everything else you can imagine. So they gave it. So immediately when it came out, they gave a lot of false information. Just so you understand, great studies came out of Italy on hydroxy. You know what I'm talking about, right? Right? Great studies came out, uh, and the combination of the three. But we had some great studies come out. Uh, Italy, France, Spain, ourselves, many, many doctors, doctors, many doctors came out and they said, uh, it's great. Now, you have to go to a doctor. I have a doctor in the White House. I said, what do you think? And it's just a line of defense. I'm just talking about as a line of defense. I'm dealing with a lot of people. Look at all the people in the room. You know, I'm the president and I'm dealing with a lot of people. And it's a very inexpensive drug. It's, it's almost pennies. It's very inexpensive. Uh, and it's been out for close to 70 years for a couple of different things, right? Lupus and malaria and even arthritis, they say. But I think it's worth it as a line of defense, and I'll stay on it for a little while longer. I'm just very curious myself. But it seems to be very safe. But that study was a phony study put out by the VA. Uh, you may want to talk about that. I mean, we could talk about that if anybody wants to. And maybe I'd ask Alice, Alex to talk about then. If you would introduce our great, talented head of the VA and let him say a couple of words. But that was a phony study, and it's very dangerous to do it. The fact is, people should want to help people, not to make political points. It's really sad when they do that. Go ahead. Yeah, so hydroxychloroquine has been approved by the FDA for decades here in the United States for the treatment of malaria, for the prevention of malaria, treatment of lupus, treatment of rheumatoid arthritis. And the system we have here in the United States that is once a drug has been approved and on the market, a doctor in consultation with a patient may use it for what we call off-label purposes, which are indications that are not yet proven and not yet in the label. And this is the right to try president. He, for the first time, got the historic right to try legislation for experimental therapies. But that applies to our existing regime, which is approved products may be used in the judgment of a physician in consultation with their patient. As the president said, and I'll ask uh, Secretary Wilkie to talk a bit about the VA study, um, there, there has been, there's been some studies around the use of hydroxychloroquine later in disease progression. Uh, but we are still working on some controlled studies earlier in the disease progression to see if we can measure the effectiveness of it in preventing the replication of the virus and spread in mild to moderate cases rather than the more serious. And that data is still pending. But and it's got, well, it's got very good right. reviews, very and good from many, many doctors, many, many doctors. Uh, yes. Secretary, please. No. Thank you, Mr. President. I, and I want to clear up something uh, that the, the media has not reported accurately. 
Now, that was not a VA study. Can you hear him? Because I think it's important. You asked the question. Yeah. Do, that was do you not, want to listen? Because I don't even think you're listening. Yeah. yeah. Go ahead. Why that don't was, you listen was, to him? That, that was not a VA study. Uh, researchers took VA numbers, and they did not clinically review them. They were not peer-reviewed. Uh, they did not even look at what the president just mentioned, the various comorbidities that the patients who were referenced in that study um, had. Uh, I also want to echo what uh, the secretary of HHS said. The instructions I received from the president were very clear, and that was to preserve and protect life. Uh, those of us who've had a military life, some of us around this table, we've been taking this drug for years. As the president mentioned, Department of Defense and VA have been using it for 65 years. On every, any given day, VA uses 42,000 doses of this drug. And what we did when this virus first hit us was to use every means necessary to help preserve life. Um, we believed that the Congress was right and the President signed legislation to protect life, the right to try. And we did this in consultation not only with the families of those veterans, but we did this in consultation with our doctors under FDA guidelines. So I want to knock down the phony story that this is somehow the VA going back on what the president told us to do, which was to use every means possible to protect and preserve the lives, the lives of our veterans. And I think, um, as the president mentioned, we've seen in many cases across this country uh, in fact, I, I was on the news the day that the governor of New York was asking you for tens of thousands of doses. That's right. Um, uh, we are doing everything we can to protect uh, the lives of our veterans, uh, and this is one of the means that we used. Thank you. Hydroxychloroquine is used by thousands and thousands of frontline workers so that hopefully they don't catch this horrible disease or whatever you want to call it. Uh, it is uh, a terrible virus. It's a terrible thing. And a lot of people are taking it. A lot of doctors are taking it. A lot of people swear by it. It's gotten a, a bad reputation only because I'm promoting it. So I'm obviously a very bad promoter. If anybody else were promoting it, they'd say, this is the greatest thing ever. But because of me. So a lot of doctors swear by it. I think we can say that, Mr. Secretary. Uh, a lot of doctors think it's great. Uh, but the one thing that is true, one way or the other, whether you like it or not, it's been around for 70 years. Unbelievably effective for malaria and for lupus, and probably effective for arthritis. And what has been determined is it doesn't harm you. It's a very powerful drug, I guess, but it doesn't harm you. And uh, so I thought, as a uh, Frontline defense, possibly it would be good, and I've I've had no impact from it. I've I've had no. I feel the same. I haven't changed. I don't think too much. And at some point, you know, I won't take it. Might be soon. Might be a little bit. It doesn't. It doesn't seem to have any impact on me, but it seems to be a uh, extra line of defense, and it's gotten tremendous reviews from some people, including many many doctors all over the world. And you should look at some of the studies. They've been amazing, some of the studies. But that's up to people, and it's up, I think, strongly recommend to people with their doctor's advice and acknowledgement, OK? Is anyone okay. else in your cabinet taking that regimen, Mr. President? Say it. Is anyone else in your cabinet taking that I don't know. Or? I don't know. I, that's a personal thing as to whether or not they want to answer that question. But uh, I think many of them would take it if they felt it was necessary. I also had a case where we had somebody fairly close to me a uh, very nice young gentleman, he tested positive. And he tested positive. Plus, I deal with Mike a, like, a lot, and Mike had somebody very close to him, who I also see, who tested positive. So I think, I thought, you know, from my standpoint, not a bad time to take it, uh, because we had the combination, those the two people, it's two people in a very big building with a lot of people working. But, uh, so I thought it would be appropriate, but it has had no impact in terms of uh, me. Okay. Uh, any other question, please? Mr. President. Yes. Uh, go ahead. You, do you want to go? Go ahead. I, I just want to ask you a question on Brazil. Who's, uh, Brazil. Which is not, yes, in third position, place now, catching up to Russia in second place for a number of cases. Are you finally considering 
a travel ban from, from Brazil and Latin America? We are considering it. Uh, we hope that uh, we're not going to have a problem. Uh, the governor of Florida is doing very, very well testing, is in particular Florida, because a big majority come into Florida. Uh, Brazil has gone more or less herd. You know what that is, herd. And they're having problems. By the way, you know, when you say that we lead in cases, that's because we have more testing than anybody else. So we test much more than anybody else. Again, we're close to 14 million. It was said 12, 12 and a half. It's actually, I think, close to 14 million now. And so we have 14 million tests. In Germany, if they do 2 million, that's a lot. And others are doing 1 million. So if you're testing 14 million people, you're going to find many more cases. Many of these people aren't very sick, but they still go down as a case. So actually, the number of cases, and we're also a much bigger country than most, so when we have a lot of cases, I don't look at that as a bad thing. I look at that as, in a certain respect, as being a good thing, because it means our testing is much better. So if we were testing a million people instead of 14 million people, we would have far fewer cases, right? So I view it as a badge of honor. Really, it's a badge of honor. It's a great tribute to the testing and all of the work that a lot of professionals have done, okay? that they're going to bring their oh, cases yeah, no, in I, I see. I mean, as to your, the first part of your question, yeah, sure. I, I worry about everything. I don't want people coming in here and affecting our people. I don't want people over there sick either. We're helping Brazil with ventilators. We're sending them ventilators, okay? They, they need ventilators. I'm sending them ventilators. We have so many thousands of them. We're sending them. We're sending a lot of people. No, Brazil is having some trouble. No question about it. Sweden, by the way, you know, I've heard a lot about Sweden and the way they do it. Well, they have, you have Norway, Denmark, Finland, Sweden, that little group of beautiful countries. Well, Sweden took a little different attitude, but Sweden has far more deaths than the other three. You know that, right? Do you know that? Yeah, a lot more death. Uh, many times the deaths. But they did it a different way, and, and you know, I understand that too. And, and as uh, Mike said very well before, there is death on both sides. There's death on both sides. There's death in staying in a shutdown also, and lots of other things. But there's also death. Okay. What do you see in terms of uh, travel to, between the United States and Europe, but lifting travel restrictions? I'd love it to open up as soon as it can, but we have to make sure that we're doing well and they're doing well. And in many cases, we are. But, you know, we have a very big country. We have some areas that have done incredibly well. We have other areas where the results are, it's tougher. New York and New Jersey are tougher. People don't realize New Jersey is the most dense state. A lot of people don't realize that. The governor's a terrific person. He's very liberal, but that's okay. He's a very liberal guy, but we like him. He's a good man, and he's working very hard. But New Jersey is a very dense area, very, very dense. And uh, I speak to Andrew a lot, Andrew Cuomo a lot, we're working very well together. And, uh, you know, those are the two spots that have really been uh, very heavily hit. A big portion, a big percentage, I don't know what it is, it's a very big percentage, almost half of our deaths would be to those two. Now, at the same time, uh, the numbers, even in those two places, are coming down. They're coming down very rapidly. And I put out yesterday's statement, numbers are coming down with the exception of very little few exceptions, the numbers are coming down all over the United States very rapidly. Very rapidly. It's a beautiful thing to watch, but it's left behind serious death, and it shouldn't have happened. Thank you very much, everybody. Thank you.